Greetings. Allow me to see your passage for the double-edged double bill, traveler, where you get two film and or media discussions for the cost of one, which is nothing. Thomas Mariani, come to the round table to randomly select the yin and yang of a double showing. One will have two good movies, the other two cursed. Both will have to pick a number between one and ten in order to seal their fates from the gods. Let the chaos begin. I am Adam, the Beef Master Thomas. And I am your fair maiden, Thomas Mariani. I just wish a prince somewhere would save me from this tower. I like how you're the female in the equation. That's Gender so is funny. fluid, Adam. Gender is fluid. Jesus, you fucking piece of shit. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> we want to welcome you to the Devil Edge Devil Bill, where this week, um, in honor of Fantastic Beasts and where to find Johnny Depp being an asshole somewhere, coming out this week, we are doing fantasy films. Not like, I, I mean, I don't know about your choice, but I didn't do any erotic fantasy. I gotta change my things real quick. <laughs> <laughs> We're going more for, like, something in the realm of knights and dragons. Swords but and sorcery. Right, but also, of course, th this could go to urban fantasy. You could do, like, a labyrinth, potentially. I'm not saying that's one of the choices we're doing. But, you know, there's fantasy is an interesting genre because you can really adapt it to the times more than people would probably give it credit for. Sure, I agree. I, I I love a good fantasy film. Mm -hmm. Erotic fantasy film. <laughs> Get your mind out of the gutter. Or I guess the uh, the slop pails that are in the dirt roads. I don't know. Yeah, or, whatever it is. This, this, is, a, this is a similar. fucking Ren Fair. Anyway, yeah. uh, but uh, for those of you who might be new to the show, um, I apologize. This is how we usually go. But basically, uh, Adam and I... Uh, have two movies we each have picked based around our general topic. We switch off on good and bad quality. In this case, Adam has the two good movies for this week. I have the two bad movies. And we assign both our movies number between 1 and 10. And the other will have to pick a number between 1 and 10 to decide both the good and then the bad movie that we cover on our double-edged double bill, as you can tell from our title. So um, I will start then, Adam, by picking number between 1 and 10 for your two good movies. And I'm going to go with number seven. At number seven on the dot, I had Willow. Oh, okay. That's that's one I have not seen. Mm -hmm. It's one of my childhood favorites, man. And I've watched it again recently, and it still holds up. I really, really like Willow. Um, and then my other choice at number two was Legend. That's one I also have not seen. You haven't seen Legend? I, I have not seen Legend, no. Oh, what the fuck, man. All right, everybody, like, send us, you know, applications for new co-hosts. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? You take on the recording and all the other shit. No, and I was going to say, say you got to be really, like, knowledgeable on how to record and edit and basically run the show. I just want to be, the, you know, one of the voices. <laughs> all right, then. I, I guess now you schmuck to make a number between <laughs> one and ten for my two choices. I'm going to go with number five, right down the middle. Okay, then. At number four, um, we're sticking in the realm of 80s fantasy, uh, but we're going for something a bit different from a Willow, I'd assume, uh, with 1987's Masters of the Universe. <laughs> oh, yeah. God, <laughs> another childhood one, but oh, I bet it's not going to hold up. <laughs> this is my fight. This is a people don't prepare to die. <laughs> I'm fucking overacting Dolph Lundgren. Oh, well, great. well, we'll okay. get into that. But first, also, my other choice, by the way, was at number nine. And that was Aragon. Oh, thank God. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're going for at least some more entertainingly bad movies. I was expecting Aragon and, like, the Golden Compass. I, I don't want to, like, do a no-win scenario for both the choices. <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. I, I can appreciate Masters of the Universe enough. So, thank yes. you for, for 
picking that one. Well, technically, it's, I picked it, so thank me. It's all in a night's work, but oh. we have to watch our double feature now, folks. So, you fair maidens and unsalted masses, or salted, I'm not sure how that goes. I don't know if you're even salted at all. Point is, we'll be right back after this. I am the greatest swordsman that ever lived. Rebel. Uh-oh. Renegade. I trust them completely. The next great hero. After them! The next great adventure. From George Lucas and Ron Howard. Willow. It'll be fun. Rated PG. Starts Friday at a theater or drive-in near you. Check newspaper for listings. And we are back. We have returned from our double feature adventure, and we have picked along uh, somebody here as a side quest to join our little <laughs> gang. Uh, we have a new guest here. It is Dan Chambos. Dan, how are you doing? Pretty good. How's everybody doing? We're off on our quest uh, to the volcano to throw the ring in. For some reason, we're <laughs> barefoot. Why are we barefoot, Adam? I just can't afford shoes. Well, yeah, that's true. We, it's it's a tough economy out there. And, I am literally right with him on that one. <laughs> yes. Uh, but let's talk about our two films for the evening. Uh, first is our good feature, which is Willow, which came out May 20th, 1988, uh, directed by Ron Howard. It was a Lucasfilm joint. Um, it was based on a story by George Lucas, um, written by Bob Dullman. And it's interesting because he apparently conceived this back in the 70s under the title of Munchkins, which I'm very glad didn't happen. That's a terrible yeah. name on so many levels. Um, it would have been a great Dunkin' Donuts crossover. Maybe, you know those tie-ins, though. That's a good point. He would have really looked for that. <laughs> and I know you gentlemen have seen this before. Yeah, I've seen it a thousand times. In fact, I have a very unpopular opinion when it comes to that for this film. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, I think Willow's better than Never Ending Story. Oh, the hot takes dropping! Oh, no, damn. I agree. Oh, shit! I mean, what's up, Thomas? What are you going to do now? <laughs> your balls in your well, corner. Well, I mean, I want to hear you guys a bit more, especially since you guys obviously grew up with this more than necessarily than I did. This is the first time I ever saw it. So how do you feel it's aged since uh, 1988? A solid 30 years. The same thing happened. It always happens when I watch this movie. So I start watching it, and I even forget that, like, what else is going on. Like, oh, I'm just sucked into the movie. The only parts where you get sucked out of the movie is when you see Val Kilmer, it seems like. Other than that, like, it's just like a great adventure movie, and um, I didn't realize, like, as an adult, I'm like, this movie's really dark in the beginning of it. Like, I didn't realize that lady got ripped to shreds and everything, and there was so much, like, uh, a little bit of the gore on there, because they use, like, uh, they like the practical effects over, the, like, um, any CGI effects, so they do a lot of that in there, and I just really can get behind practical items. And I thought they did a really good job, and I, I think it held up. I loved this movie when I was a kid. I still love it. You watch it now, but, I mean, you do kind of realize it's just Lord of the Rings, but instead of a ring, it's a baby. And kind of like Hard Boiled, too, because they're always holding that baby around getting all these fight scenes. It... A bit less tense than Hard Boiled, admit yeah. <laughs> I think it holds up pretty well, man. And see, I, I'm the opposite with uh, the Val Kilmer. Val Kilmer stuff doesn't take me out of the movie. I think Val Kilmer's actually one of the best in the movie. Um at least one of the most entertaining. But yeah, I think it holds up, man. I mean, there's a couple things in it where you're like, uh, it's borderline offensive, but I still <laughs> think it's a fun movie, man. I like how they use some of that video editing techniques that they used when they use like Army of Darkness to make little people look small. This it's the technique that you mentioned, like in Army of Darkness, where they would shoot like all the stuff that's with the large people and then mm -hmm. project it over and have Correct. like the elements of the different characters, like Kevin Pollock and Rick Overton as the brownies. Which I'll say, I liked Willow um, watching it this first time. Fuck the brownies. <laughs> they are no, garbage, awful side characters that I can't stand. Yeah, I, I... They, they kind of remind me of, in, say, another Lucasfilm-produced fantasy film, uh, Labyrinth. It's like, hey, let's take those guys from Chili Down and make them side characters throughout the whole movie. Which I would yeah. hate that movie if that was the case. Um, <laughs> and mainly, they do stop using them at a certain point overbearingly, but there's a point, like, especially when they go to that bar, and they have them just like, how <laughs> long are they getting drunk off fucking beer? It just, it's forever. <laughs> it's just like, this movie's already two hours long, guys. You could have easily cut so much of this brownie stuff and would have been far more tolerable to me. But, 
I agree with what Adam said about, I think, Val Kilmer and also, obviously, Warwick Davis as our titular character are really the glue that keep this movie together. Because, you know, Willow is a classic sort of George Lucas, Harold's Journey archetype of just, like, he's this guy who wants to get out of the sort of rut that he's in, become a great sorcerer, and he's a good, solid hero to class the movie around, and then he comes into, you know, he meets these other characters, like, especially Val Kilmer as Mad Mardigan, which, especially mm-hmm. watching this, I'm just like, damn, we took Val Kilmer for granted. Oh, it's <laughs> so great. He's yeah. so charming and roguish. He's one of the few to kind of capture that unattainable Harrison Ford-style quality that so many people wanted to have in the 70s and 80s. That's a he good just... point, man. Yeah. Yeah, oh, give no, me a sword, Eric, I'll win this war for you. And you know what? <laughs> he did. <laughs> yeah, no, no, he, I mean, he really did, um, but yeah, I, completely. but I just love even the way he's introduced inside of that cage, and he's mm. caged up, and he just, he looks so filthy, and grimy, and seedy, and then as the movie progresses, it becomes more and more of just, like, this hero that he, you know he is capable of being, and we get hints of, it's a great example of, like, really building that guy up from being at the lowest possible level. I just love the way that he genuinely become so much more of a hero by the end of the movie. It feels very authentic. It's the most satisfying arc of the whole movie. You know, like the costuming in this movie is so good too. Like that gold armor he gets is so epic looking and yeah, like, yeah he deserves that and it looks badass. And then, you know, the main bad guys like her general where he's got the skull mask and how menacing that looks. Completely, and his voice is out of control. <laughs> <laughs> Bring me the child! <laughs> Which I found out, by the way, th- that actor is a uh, Pat Roach, who is in a lot of Lucasfilm productions particularly. He is in all three of the original Indiana Jones movies. In the original Indiana Jones in particular, he's the guy Indy fights at the airplane. No! See, that's him! The guy that gets killed? The yes, German with the, the propeller. Yes, that's him. Ah! Holy shit, I would have never pegged that. Wow. Yes, and then the second one, he's the guy who attacks Indy in his room, um, yeah. who like gets hung by the fan, and he's one of the Nazis chasing after them at the biplane in Last Crusade. Um, I can... That's crazy. Yes. That guy uh, cannot die. He's a really good stunt performer, um, and he's really um, menacing, I agree, in this part, even though it is totally just, it's Darth Vader. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. I like how the people in the movie were actually of a certain height. I like seeing actual little people instead of, like, actors being transformed into little people. So, like, instead of Elijah Wood, basically, Correct. what you're getting. And Warwick Davis, you know, he he is really good in it. He can be annoying, but... It's that voice thing that comes It's up. his voice. Yeah, it's just his voice. Oh, yeah, he's good, but... <laughs> Kaya! Oh. <laughs> oh. when like the dogs attack their village <laughs> and that little girl willow's daughter standing there just crying that breaks my heart every time i see it i'm like, <laughs> like i want to save her but then it's like there's giant like i don't know what the fuck they are bat goblin dogs <laughs> running around like, i ain't going in there i think they do a great job of endearing you to willow at the start where he's very, he's a luke skywalker but i didn't even know before this that he was like a family man yeah, Which, he's a family man. That's what I like about it. Whenever I saw the covers of Willow, I was just like, oh, he's probably some young buck who's, like, trying to make his way. But it's like, oh, no, he's actually, like, he has a family. He's trying to keep the, his crops alive. He's got that asshole landlord dude who I love, too. And in the beginning of the movie, like, you know he has that heart, but he doesn't. But he's like, don't, we can't take this on, you know, it'll cause a trouble. And then he starts, like, a little overreacting. He's like, oh, have you this and that? And they'll be on me for this and that. And then you're like, hello, no one's listening to me. And has the wife made a decision to take the baby? He's a believable everyman. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. That. Which I, I really was endeared to, especially in this context, but also biggest credit to perhaps my favorite little person actor of all time, Billy Barty, as the main wizard guy. I love him so much, and, he, and he's good in everything. Yes, he's the connecting thing of our double feature, which we'll oh, get into. It's a who's who of little people actors, where you do have Tony Cox, um, is in there, uh, Phil uh, Fondacaro, I believe is his name, who you've seen like a bunch of other stuff. Half of the Time Bandits are in this movie, Kenny Baker shows up at yeah. one point. Yeah. He's the guy in like the big meeting where he's just like, but who will go? Um, that's <laughs> Kenny Baker. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yes, R2-D2. Um, but, I mean, it is, like, definitely, George Lucas is just like, hey, all the guys who are Ewoks, bring them back. Right, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, basically. basically. 
Yeah, pretty much. Um, but they do believe. I like how they build a believable world there, where it is. It's like Hobbiton, basically. But mm-hmm. they do a great job building up, like we mentioned, sort of the society that's there, and then journeying onward to find the you know taller people, as it were. Um, you really are rooting for them, at, at, for Willow and everybody else as they're lugging around this baby, which I will also say, they cut to that baby so much. They they <laughs> love you. doing baby reaction shots. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I think I you agree. cut if you cut a lot of them out, you could probably save five minutes of the movie. <laughs> because God it's a damn. cute baby, man. No, it's Thank a God. very cute baby. But I'll also say, you did mention the dogs. Yeah. The one effect that didn't quite hold up for me was just like, these dogs in really crappy suits. Oh yeah, no, I mean a hundred percent. They just threw like faux black rugs on top of them. We're like, oh, <laughs> and like a Halloween mask. I'm just thinking, like these poor dogs, get them oh, out yeah, of there. Definitely. But I do yeah, agree yeah. that like there is a viciousness, especially when like the midwife tries to put the baby out to the river and then gets mauled to death. Like that's that... what I'm talking about in the beginning. Yeah. Like I didn't realize that she got ripped to shreds. I forgot about that. Yeah, that's yeah, hardcore. <laughs> um, I will say though, I mean. To me, other than the brownies, even though she's absolutely gorgeous in it, and I understand why Val Kilmer and her kind of fell in love after this movie, Sorsha is kind of a waste of a character. It's a shame, but it's a because it's a really cool setup that she's like becomes the yeah. head of the guard for her mother's um, evil queen uh, army, and that's a great like conflict to have, especially when Val Kilmer in probably my favorite scene of the whole movie where he's drenched in the love potion stuff and yeah, uh, becomes right, right. infatuated with her. It's such a great over the top silly scene and in that conflict I really like the two I think they both have chemistry obviously because as you mm-hmm. mentioned they later become married the year this came out. I, it, it still does feel at the same time I think they just lose her character in that third act. I I agree and I mean she has more conflict with her mother than she does like totally just becoming good. So... Right. Yeah, I mean, she she switches over to our hero side pretty quick, mm-hmm, kind of so. just because Val Kilmer comes on to her. <laughs> is um so if her mom's the queen, that makes her a princess, right? I mean, I mean technically, yeah, I guess. right. Which yeah. would make uh, Val Kilmer the uh, scoundrel, like Star Wars. <laughs> What crazy? George Lucas had familiar ideas in his movies. Damn, no, you're on, he, he, you're both. I mean, yeah, dude, it's Star Wars mixed with Lord of the Rings. That's this movie, but it's done really well, dude. And I mean, Ron Howard does a pretty good job directing. I mean, of course, I mean he is Ron Howard, but. I, I did love the fact that the old friend of the guard is played by Gavin O'Hillary, which I didn't even realize he played Chuck Cunningham on Happy Days. The brother who disappeared on Happy Days. Oh my Days. god, you're right. Right, I didn't even realize yeah, that. Yeah, you're right. The boring yeah. one. <laughs> yes. They're like, yeah, you don't need two of them. <laughs> yeah. Right, the yeah, one who basically. literally went up the stairs in the second season and never showed up again. Mm-hmm. This being your first time, Thomas... Like, obviously, we talked about how does it hold up or whatever, but put yourself as a child for seeing this. What would you have thought? Oh, I probably would have really liked it. Um, I was a big fan of Lucasfilm Productions as a kid. I'm sure I would have really liked this. I mean, the same way that I liked, like, A Labyrinth or, you know, like, the Star Wars films, obviously. Uh, I, I I probably would have been a huge fan of it and maybe grown up and had some of these issues. Like, then again, also, keep in mind, I was a kid when the prequels came out, and I liked Jar Jar Binks. We grew up. Oh, so you might have even liked the brownies. Yeah. I know that's the yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you might like the brownies. Um, yeah, <laughs> back then. But I think, um, I, yeah, because I, I would agree. I think it's a perfectly solid kids' fantasy movie. And I think it's because I agree it builds up um, a, a lot of great stuff with the world, and these characters are endearing, um, and there's still a lot of like fun slapstick stuff that still supports a lot of like the main characters. Um, I, I would still just say, then again, I probably wouldn't have watched this as much because I still think it is far too long at two hours. It's I think, a little too long, dude. I, I, yeah. I, I think you could cut a good 20 minutes to tw- two and a half hour tops out of this and still have a pretty solid movie. I mean, Lord of the Rings could have been called Lord of the Walking. It had like an hour of walking in each movie. But I mean, they, I would argue they <laughs> built up more of a world and a lot more characters yeah. and a lot, we won't I get agree. into that discussion well, yeah, anyway, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but no, I, I think Willow, the trouble is it definitely has a thinner plot at the same time going on because it's kind of like you, a one and done deal. 
Well, no, I agree. I don't think you could have really made a franchise out of this. It's a good one-and-done story here. But at the same time, I wish they would have spent more time. Maybe I agree with Adam developing stuff like the Joanna Whaley character, or even our queen. Also, the witch, who has been transformed into different animals. Yeah, that like was that. cool. I agree, especially like the actual sequence where she morphs into various different animals before transforming back. Um, yeah. was one of the early examples of digital morphing, which actually holds up so pretty well. Though they watching used real it, animals. <laughs> well, right, I mean, they used real animals, but also the way they actually morphed into other yeah. these other animals. It was actually, it holds up pretty well, even though watching it the whole time, I am kind of waiting for black and white to start. Yeah, sure. Because it's course, the same exact fucking awesome. effect. <laughs> it's it black, awesome. it's white. But um, they did make it look painful, too, which was yes. kind of cool. Oh, yeah. Like, like when she starts pain. sprouting the feathers and shit, you're like, oh, my God, no. Well, oh. You're like, oh, fuck. <laughs> Didn't Stop she call him you're terrible at one rat. point? You're terrible. She says, like, you idiot when he she yeah. becomes a goat. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's what I like about it is that, admittingly, I don't think the magic's very well built up in this particular universe, but I'm still endeared to Willow trying. Like, Warwick Davis puts so much effort into pointing a wand at something, which in practice, would be pretty fucking stupid. Like, my favorite sort of bit of magic in the movie is during the climax when just a random shard of magic hits that table and it comes to life and starts yeah, chasing that was around cool, Willow. Man. No, I love they that. They could have done a lot more with that, too. Right. That could have been really cool. What I would have liked to have seen is more with um, Eric and the army. Right. Yeah. Just to see what devastation they've been fighting the whole time or whatever. You don't really get that much of a sense of that. Mm -hmm. Um other than through just quick snippets of dialogue. I think that would have been kind of cool. Just reminded me of, like, from Army of Darkness, how, like, uh, what, the same guy, wasn't his name, like, Eric the Red? Oh, I mean, you're right. He's basically just, like, he's the character who's just like, oh, you're a hero, he's a failure, he's not gonna do anything. And then later on, it's like, I always believed in you. <laughs> that's yeah, what he... of course I do. <laughs> I mean, basically, that's what he is, even though, also, whenever I see that dude, I'm just like, is that William Atherton? No, it's not William <laughs> like, he looks so much like fucking Peck from Ghostbusters, to the point where they keep saying Peck, that's what they keep calling Willow. He does look like William Atherton. Yeah, I do agree that the biggest basic downfall of this movie is, A, the brownies rule and Frangine, and then there are bits in here, it just gets too silly for a couple seconds. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know that we need to see the bird shit on Burgle Cut. <laughs> You're but, talking like Val Kilmer rolling down a mountainside and turning into a giant snowball? <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, I get it, though. I mean, that obviously is for the kids. But I remember even as a kid going, this is silly. <laughs> this is, well, it, takes, well, I, it does only take you out of it a couple of those scenes. See, there are points where I think the silliness really works. Like, my favorite probably silly bit of the whole movie is with Billy Barty, when he does the whole thing with the bones. Let me consult the bones! And then he throws them yeah. down, and he's just like, the bones tell me nothing. Do you have love for this child? Yes, I do. The bones have spoken! <laughs> like, that's great. That's the exact tone that fits for the silliness of the movie. Not so much when, like, right after that you have, say, like, um, that character, the, the landlord guy, comes up and is just like, well, I think Willow should lead. Well, somebody should protect him. How about you? You volunteered. And he's like, other guy! And that feels too sitcom-y. And, and then <laughs> Iris is out like a Looney Tunes cartoon after that point. <laughs> uh, with the editing, it also was like, there's a lot of them Star Wars wipe transitions. Oh, yeah. Dude. Oh, my God. They couldn't get past that, George. <laughs> uh -uh. <laughs> the, the, the same effects transitions you get in Windows Movie Maker. Are George Lucas's favorites. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. I do remember also seeing this as a child. I mean, I could see kids seeing this today and still liking it. It would probably be dated for a lot of kids who have seen mm -hmm. like The Lord of the Rings or you know things like that. But I'll tell you, when I was a kid, two things in this movie scared the living piss out of me. One was the trolls, and two was the two-headed whatever it was that is just born out of that troll soupy ball that Which, falls out. That's the thing. Seems that's like a brain. Well, well, watching it that this time, like, that was a scene where I knew, like, if I was a child, I would have been terrified, is when the troll becomes, like, that horrific, like, amniotic sack of whatever the fuck mm -hmm. that is. That's terrifying. <laughs> it's so gross. Yep. It looked... It reminded me of, like, it looked like the things that come out of the mouth of the Tremors. The weird, horrible tongues? Yeah. yeah, I can see that. Yeah, that's what they always reminded me of, is, like, the things from Tremors. Yes. Oh, and, uh, we, we should mention that Two-Headed Dragon is called Eborsisk, 
in honor of Siskel and Ebert. <laughs> yes, and also, of course, the lead general is um, General Kale, which is a reference to Pauline Kale, another critic, who was very prominent at the time, who wow. um, was also not usually a fan of George Lucas movies. How coincidental. I, I do like that um, the two-headed creature as well, because what I like about a lot of the designs for these fantasy creatures is they definitely resemble these fantasy creatures that you would know, but they don't look like the traditional versions of them. Like with the the dragon has sort of this weird like hammerhead shark kind of thing to it, mm-hmm. with like this weird like sort of horn design that doesn't feel like a traditional dragon. In the same way, like even the trolls are more like apes, but in a way that's still very intimidating. Yeah, right, exactly, and. and... I, I thought they did a really good job with them, like climbing down the sides of the buildings and other under the bridge, things like that. Like they definitely made them scary because I mean, let's be honest. Without that build up to them, if you would have seen them, you'd be like, "What the fuck is this?" <laughs> hey, two thousand one, <laughs> a space odyssey called. They want their monkey suits back, right? Basically, <laughs> when you're a child, man, it works. Yes, it's scarier than hell. Oh, they also aren't afraid to have them like die horribly, like when that. Dragon grabs one of the trolls and, like, bites it in half, and the other half is bitten off by the other head. Oh, yeah, they, like, play tug-of-war with it. One thing, though, that I do want to bring up, I do like that, ultimately, it's his trick that failed in the beginning is what wins the day. Right. Yeah. He doesn't even need to use the wand. He doesn't need to use anything. It's his humble magic and trickery. That's what saves the day. And I, I just thought that was kind of a cool little moment. It's more about him building confidence in himself and him becoming all-powerful. Like, a lesser movie would probably have him do a giant, magical, awesome thing suddenly. But instead, it is just more of, like, he hasn't mastered any of the sorcery. I kind of like that Willow is barging in on an epic fantasy battle, and his small little trick is what saves everything. That's a lot more humbling, it's a lot more endearing. And even, like, they show that all of his, like, his more powerful magic doesn't work. Like, he throws the stone... Uh, that would turn people into stone, and she just reverses it. I love that effect, by the way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a really cool effect as well. Um, but yeah, it, it's a good... I do like how that climax sort of builds up Willow, kind of trying to use a lot more traditional magic, but it's more about staying true to himself as a person that ends up yeah. winning the day. He even yeah, stands up to her and says, No, I will not! You know, he's like yelling at her and stuff, and then he gets the courage to even throw the thing, and then... Mm-hmm was right into the ending and you're like man she should probably just run up and kick this guy or something but you know <laughs> but, but that's got... not dignified for that witch character no. <laughs> I, I do like that they build up the queen as sort of someone who completely wants to is so like absorbed in her idea of like what power is and what she can do that she doesn't want to do something like that and it's believable to why she, you wouldn't do that kind of stupid cinema sins thing it's like well what did she just kick the little willow in the grab a plot hole failure Terrible movie. I mean, she's going around and collecting pregnant ladies and keeping them down in a dungeon to see what their arms look like. And if they don't like you, she just kill her. Like she had no second thoughts about that. Kill her, and then no. it just cuts to the lady running away. And I did like the costume choice that basically yeah. she's got this robe and this crown, and then underneath she's just wrapped like mummy wraps. Basically, it was right. very sort of well. I mean, obviously, just creepy. There's no question. Looking at her, she's evil as fuck. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. She was a pretty good antagonist. I mean, it helped that, you know, she had Kale and the trolls and the dragon and things like that, but I think she did pretty good. Yeah, Jean Marsh is the name of that actress. Yeah. Um, though I will say, you mentioned Ron Howard, and I do want to say that I think my biggest sort of trouble is Ron Howard works so much more as, like, an actor's director, I think. And that's why the stuff that really works is when, like, you have Val Kilmer and Warwick Davis interacting with each other. Like, I love the bit we didn't talk about it, but where Val Kilmer is caught having an affair in the bar and dresses up in drag. And oh, yeah, that's great. Love all that stuff. And I think that's where Ron Howard really works the best, because that's, like, the best movies that he's usually done have been where it's, like, sort of characters in an enclosed space kind of talking to each other, like a Frost Nixon, like an Apollo 13, even, um, yeah. as opposed to, I think the bigger fantasy action sequences are serviceable, but never that memorable in the movie. Oh. Yeah, I can agree with that. And uh, you can also tell that George Lucas had his hands in this. Mm-hmm. Like we talked about with the wipes and everything. I mean, there are certain parts of this movie where it looks like George Lucas may have even been directing it. I mean, probably not. But still, it, it, to me, not to the level, but I almost got a very uh, Toby Hooper, Steven Spielberg vibe. With Ron Howard, it seems definitely a lot more like he's just so nice. He's just like, sure, George, you take the camera. Have right. fun with it. Yeah. 
Hey, whatever you want, man. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Anytime he's just like, I don't know, George, I want to direct this scene. It's like, okay, I'm going to give you your start with American Graffiti. I guess that's fine. Oh, George, you know what? You take it. You do it. Yeah. You know what, Have man? Fun. You're right. I owe all of this to you, George. All of this. You take over the whole thing. <laughs> Um, well, I guess let's get into our final thoughts for Dan. Your final thoughts on Willow. I don't criticize a lot of movies. I just really like how I still feel the same. That's it. Like, I feel the same about the movie. Um, I just didn't realize it was as dark as it is. Adam? Um, you know, this one was a childhood favorite of mine. I still think Val Kilmer turns in one of his best performances in this movie. He's so fun to watch. And it, like you said earlier, and I never even thought of it that way, he's like the perfect non-Harrison Ford roguish hero. When the comedy, when it doesn't get too silly, it works. The action's serviceable enough, especially for children. I think it would really work. Um, the story, again, you know, it's Lord of the Rings and Star Wars mixed, but, I mean, if you're going to copy a couple stories, those aren't bad ones to copy. I think it would help if you saw this when you were a kid for you to like it now. I think children who have seen maybe the newer Lord of the Rings movies or even the newer Star Wars movies might have a problem maybe staying focused with it because um, it is dated in a lot of the, like the effects. But I still think it's a fun movie. I don't think anybody would ever watch this and not at least, you know, get a couple chuckles or... You can't hate Willow. I mean, if you hate Willow, then you really need to, like, you know, get a horse and go move to the mountains and not bother anybody. <laughs> <laughs> that needs to be on the 30th anniversary Blu-ray edition. <laughs> right. <laughs> right up front under the title. Um, I mean, as for me, being the first time I had watched it, but still someone who enjoys that Lucasfilm 80s aesthetic, uh, I had fun with Willow. I liked it. I think, like you mentioned, Val Kilmer is so enthralling to watch. It's worth watching just for Val Kilmer. But Warwick Davis is also fun. They play off each other pretty well. I like a lot of the effects work. I like a lot of the um, sort of stuff where they're kind of building up the world that we should build up a bit better. I think it's serviceably directed. I think it's it's charming in its own little way. I would still say, unlike you guys, I prefer Neverending Story, which I didn't see as a kid either. <laughs> I didn't see that until about like college, and I prefer Neverending Story a bit more to this. But still, Willow, it's charming, it's fun. If you hadn't seen it before, and even if you're a bit over the <laughs> obvious age of recommendation... It still is a charming little watch. I think this movie was in a lot of doubt about being made. People, George Lucas had trouble getting it uh, funded by another studio along with Lucasfilm because there was so many issues. But like, fantasy films don't make money. In the 80s, there were a lot of big fantasy flops. And maybe one of the movies that was an example of this that tried to steer MGM away from financing Willow was a little movie called Masters of the Universe. Preview audiences have already discovered a new hero. He has! It's action. It's nothing but action. Skeletor! Skeletor! Skeletor, he's a madman. He's bad. Great movie. Dolph Lundgren is He-Man. Frank Langella is Skeletor. It was so much like Star Wars, and I love Star Wars. Kind of hot. Masters of the Universe, rated PG. Starts tomorrow at theaters everywhere. So, Masters of the Universe, which is based on the popular action figure line of He-Man in the Masters of the Universe, which also spun off a bunch of different things, including a, um, a TV series, obviously a very popular cartoon, which also spawned off She-Ra, which also spawned off a bunch of other things. One of the th little spin-off things from Mattel was this film production, which was produced through Canon Films, which... We haven't talked about canon. Strike one. Strike one. Right? Well, I just found out who they are when I was when I was researching it, and they're basically the LJN of movies. That's an apt description. Um, but sometimes that's incredibly endearing. Sometimes it's extensively awful. <laughs> um, it's never really good. Just no. like LJN. <laughs> <laughs> How for many sure. games do we buy for Nintendo by LJN? We're like, it's going to be based off the movie. It's going to be cool. Can't wait to play Back to the Future. And you're dodging cats and garbage cans. See, the, the one that, that hit me hard was Beetlejuice. Because that's such a cool movie to do a game off of. And that's such a shitty game. That's yeah, a terrible game. Terrible game. But that's like a sidetrack. So, Canon Films produces the He-Man and the Masters of the Universe film, just called Masters of the Universe for whatever reason. I'm not sure why. And, of course, who do you get to play strong, burling Prince Adam slash He-Man? 
Dolph Lundgren, who looks the part. <laughs> that's why, dude. I mean, that's the reason. <laughs> and he's so jacked. I didn't realize how jacked he was. I, I mean, he was ripped. Well, obviously, because this is just after Rocky IV, where he mm-hmm. became an iconic villain um, of sorts, and everyone was just like, wow, he's so big. Let's have him <sighs> say a lot of dialogue in English. Well, but because he had, he's on a total hot streak after Ivan Drago, because, I mean, Ivan Drago's probably the best Rocky villain, I'd argue, next to Apollo Creed in the first. And so he's on this hot streak, and he's doing great, and he's not going to cost that much. So, I mean, they didn't have to pay him that much, so you get him. I mean, I under, I completely understand the casting of him. There's other cast members where I'm like, wait, what the fuck? I understand why they cast him. I don't understand him half the time when he speaks. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure get it. But I did want to ask. So, um, you guys are a bit older than I am. Were you guys fans of He Man at the time when it was in its big heyday in the early '80s? Oh my god, I fucking loved He Man, dude. I loved He Man. I watched it every time it was on. I had all the action figures and even the worst ones you could get. I had Stinkor, who. <laughs> was the one that supposedly smelled like a skunk, the action figure. I had Moss Man, who was just covered with, like, felt. I had all of them. Which, by the way, Moss Man was just a green-colored beast man. Like, that's literally how cheap oh, it was. I, mean, for sure, I would definitely recommend go to Netflix and watch the Toys That Made Us episode about He-Man. Oh, that's cool. It's tremendous, which goes through just how much... Quite frankly, backstabbing there was in the toy industry, oh, especially stop. with He-Man. That literally half of that episode is just people saying, "I came up with this idea." No, I came up with this idea. Fuck both those two. I came up with it. <laughs> exactly. But no, I loved He-Man, dude. So when I found out this movie was coming out, I was so stoked. I mean, and I was only, I think, I was God five when this came out, and. Uh, <laughs> well, well, what about Dan? Go, were you were you yeah, a fan of He-Man? Dan. This was my first time seeing the damn movie. I wasn't that big into it. I knew who he was because, you know, the, oh, I got the power and you want to be this big jack dude and everything. But I didn't have any of the toys. I probably watched episodes, but I wasn't like a devoted fan. I was like mm-hmm. Turtles, Ghostbusters. I was aware of it, but it wasn't my like life at that yeah. point. You were too busy like cruising for chicks and <laughs> Playing pickup games at age yeah. six, like a yeah, rebel, right. banging out some Legos every once in a while when I had free time. Well, I'm a bit younger than both you guys, so He Man was a bit before my time, though, because most of my exposure to He Man was the 2000s reboot they did on Cartoon Network, which is actually pretty dope. Or the meme from like what a decade ago with the hey, 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 hey. that animated show in the 2000s. They made actually like a genuinely good animated show as opposed to the original He Man. Which I've seen in oh, pieces. Atrocious. Oh, atrocious. <laughs> Though then again, I um, I wish they would have just dubbed over Dolph Lundgren with not the He Man voice, but the Prince Adam voice. Hello, everybody. I'm Prince right, Adam. And he's still like super buff. Like, who's buying that <laughs> well, this guy just takes off his pink vest? <laughs> <laughs> he should just um, put on glasses. Everyone would have disguised it perfectly. Now, um, right. they were going to dub the voice with somebody different to begin with, but it was a budget reason. So he just said, screw it, I'm going to keep his lines in there. Lundgren was never supposed to actually say those lines. They were supposed to be dubbed over by somebody else. They completely wipe out the whole idea of Prince Adam. I mean, he's just He-Man the whole time. Right. Um, it's a shame. So I would that, have loved so... to have seen Dolph Lundgren in that pink vest. That would have been you the best thing. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say, even though he completely doesn't look like the character, Frank Langella chews up every bit of scenery in this movie. Best part of the whole movie, for sure. Oh, 100%. Easily he was 100%. Frank Langella. Fantastic. He was 100% into it because his children liked that I read, and so he wanted yeah. to do the role even more then, so he put like more effort. I haven't even heard that he even like added stuff to the character in the movie. Oh, yeah, dude. He added lines. He, he did everything. And I mean, and that makeup is still pretty legit. Mm-hmm. Designed by William Stout of Return of the Living Dead fame, who did a lot of the zombies in there. Right. Um, and it's tremendous. I, I agree that, like, the so much, like, oomph and j- maddening joy that he puts into that performance, especially, there's a whole bit where He-Man comes back and he's spouting this garbage about just, like, I have contained the power and I will destroy you all, but he has so much, like, 
believability behind it that you don't give a shit it makes no sense because he's yeah, no, so he's into all of it yeah, yeah. he's 100 percent on board oh yeah he's he's so into it and even when he's in his fucking like ultimate armor which looks like a just so banana stupid so <laughs> dumb like but he's he's still he's trying to sell it that whole thing where he's just like what is the loneliness of good like is it like the loneliness of evil he man like what the fuck does that <laughs> even mean I love that final fight, though, where it just cuts to, like, shots of He-Man. Flipping a sword. <laughs> like, nothing's happening. I like a lot of the other villains in the movie, too. Like, Meg Foster's Evil Lynn, I think, is oh, kind of chewing fantastic. it up. She was yeah, great, she was really... and I, I didn't realize until I had, I had to research it, and I was like, oh, she is the lady from They Live. Like, her eyes yes. give away who she is. To oh, me. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I love they were going to put in context, they're just like, no, your eyes are perfect. No, your eyes are yeah, perfect. Why would you? I did like some of the villains, too. I thought Beast Man looked pretty good. Like, the costume and everything was decent. The, like, lizard guy in the gold. You know, that looked legit. But the way they made his neck, like, almost have that sack when he breathes. Yeah. He looked fucking really good, dude. That's where most of the budget clearly went because then you look I, at the I think so. then you also look at the set and I love the set of this movie where like whenever they're in Skeletor's um, taking over Castle Grayskull and it's just like oh man so this is less of like a big studio film production and it looks more like a stunt show at a theme park in like the best way. Hundred oh, percent. <laughs> but I would totally <laughs> watch the He Man stunt show with these people in it. It might be better at like half an hour versus an hour forty five minutes. <laughs> Shamu needs to take a rest but <laughs> while you wait the he man stop spectacular well, and even when they're like fighting each other it looks like the choreography of a stunt show like that oh, sword fight so Adam's mentioning which is like Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay I'm just gonna go ahead and say I honestly think one of the biggest problems with this movie is that they had them come to earth yeah well they yeah should never should have should have just taken place in Eternia even when they do go to earth there's so much boring let's find the MacGuffin to it it's oh, like we, yeah, with the we key? gotta, we gotta yeah. find the cosmic key we gotta find the key we gotta do play the music whatever the hell um and kevin and julie who gives a fuck well i don't know if i was a small child going into a he-man movie i'm like could i have more existential grief drama because <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what her i want are bad, so she's leaving because she doesn't want to remember but he sure does love her <laughs> oh man i really want to see this unfold I mean, army can hold back for a second. <laughs> the entire point that her parents are dead is because of that guy. Because she it, decided to go out with him and then they went out on their other trip. Yeah, because she didn't to want to beach with everybody. Trip, yeah. yeah. So it's I guess you can't you can't blame him. It's not like he fucking doped up the hey, pilot. He would have <laughs> came back in time and changed it, they probably wouldn't have died. That would have been the it's, dopest twist. I mean though, that's how the like, ending is that he doped up the pilot. Yeah, that, that <laughs> would have been the best twist possible. <laughs> Put it in their great. coffees or something. I will I say uh James Tolkien is good in it though. He's good in everything. Who would you recognize just... of course as the principal from the Back to the Future movies? Oh. Yeah. Oh my god, I love that guy, especially at the end where he finally gets a hang of it. Wait a second, what? I can kill these guys? And he shoots off like seven to eight shotgun rounds and then you don't hear him reloading, you just hear him kind of shooting again. <laughs> yep, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Just walks out there with a twelve gauge, starts pumping shots into these goddamn. And every shot hits. He literally went to the same classes that Charles Bronson did for the Death Wish sequels, also <laughs> produced by Canon. It's well, same class Arnold went to for Commando. Right, exactly. Which, it, it... Yeah, fire from the hip, man. You're gonna hit everything. Hey, as long as you squint your eyes a bit and you flex, you're good. <laughs> exactly. Yes, but you know, honestly, like watching this, especially this time, because I'd seen this before, um, but seeing it this time, I honestly just kept thinking, man. Did Kenneth Branagh just watch this and be like, I could make this a watchable movie? And he did the first Thor? Yeah. Because it's totally the first yeah. Thor beat for beat. <laughs> oh, I mean, it totally is, dude. You're not wrong at no. all. <laughs> and, you know, it's funny. When I first saw Thor, because I think I saw that one at the theater, and I literally thought that in the theater. I'm like, hey, I've seen this before. The first, like, 20 minutes or so is in the world of Eternia. Yeah. I.e. Asgard. We go to Earth. We're looking for a MacGuffin. We find yeah. a couple human characters, who, but also we have the villains kind of intrude on the real world. It, it, it's so much beat for beat, the, the first Thor movie. Let's get to some of the other side characters. Chelsea Field as Tila. She's she's so annoying to me. Yeah. You know, uh, I did like Man at Arms. Yes. I thought he, he was pretty good. Um, and even though I hate Gwildor, the character, Billy Barty's giving it his all, dude. 
<laughs> I mean, he's clearly a stand-in for Orko. Which, honestly, like, of all the stuff from the original He-Man cartoon, I like the design of Orko a lot, actually. But obviously, they couldn't do, like, this floating character in this live-action movie in the 80s, so they stuck with putting Billy Barty in what looks like Harry Knowles' makeup. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> they, they never explained to me, at least, where the pink 1959 Cadillac gets there with, like, the language built into it from their, like, native he land. Does. He, he, he just does. finds it. He fucking finds yeah, it and he, he just... Okay, because I watched this movie twice, back to back, in the same, at this, in the oh, same night, and I was like, what did I miss on this Cadillac part? Ah, he finds it and soups it up, man. He's a fucking wizard from space. What do you think? <laughs> oh, well, okay. well, to be fair, it's done in, like, throwaway dialogue. There's so much of yeah, that. Yeah, that's okay. Where, like, but... where, like, just Billy Barty's just ADR, like, hey, man, look what I did. But no, I agree that Billy Barty's kind of putting his all into it. Like, even, there's the point where he just randomly walks up, just like, look, I have a human disguise. And he's got fucking sunglasses and bullshit. Right, and some, like, big, like, straw hat. <laughs> what the heck is that thing? So you find this... Thing in a smoldering crater, right? And your first instinct is, it's got to be one of those new synthesizers from Japan. Oh my god! Yeah, <laughs> of course you're not going to come see me play tonight. No, Kevin, no one wants to see your shitty band. <laughs> Think about this. It's good. I like it. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh yeah. Great. It mm-hmm. had no rhythm to it too. It's like dun 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 dun. And I know, and in her head, she's like, "This is one of the reasons I'm leaving." The, the parents died so they could intentionally not see this band performing. So they didn't, have to, <laughs> they didn't have to support the white band. <laughs> they were so ashamed of our, da- our daughter. So, oh my god, her makes poor decisions. Let's go kill ourselves in a That's plane a crash. So, so they're brought back to life, and really, they're just living in misery at the end of the movie when they have the happy ending. Just like, oh gosh, she's with that fucking Kevin kid. Hey, we're not going on the plane. By the way, are you still seeing Kevin? <laughs> oh. <laughs> We're going to yeah. go run the car in the garage. <laughs> oh, yeah. right. and, and here's an interesting question. So, which is a worst first performance, like first movie for a friend star? This for Courtney Cox or Leprechaun for Jennifer Aniston? Leprechaun for Jennifer Aniston. Well, I do think Jennifer Aniston has become a better actress than Courtney Cox, but Courtney Cox seems to be trying a little bit more in this than Jennifer mm-hmm. Aniston did Leprechaun. Right. Like, Jennifer Aniston Leprechaun clearly knew what type of movie she was in, and I don't think she really gave much of a fuck. Well, I agree, because, like, Courtney Cox clearly is going on this, like, oh, it's based on a popular toy, kids are going to see this, it's going to be super big. Well, they thought this movie was going to be huge, dude. This movie was supposed to cost $17 million, and it ballooned up to $22 million for the budget, <laughs> making it the biggest budget canon film ever. Um, but that makes sense. I mean... Well, yeah. Consider the profit margin, which I found this out in the Toys That Made Us episode. In 1986, for the He-Man franchise, $400 million. In 1987, oh. when this movie came out, sunk down to $7 million. Because I even remember as a kid falling off of He-Man because it was just repainted versions of their figures. Or, you know, the same figure, but with a new chest piece. and shit. People just stopped caring. They went into overexposure mode for it. It just ballooned, and it be- literally did, like, the mushroom effect, where it got so big, within one year, it was the biggest thing ever, and then just dead. So, and it's almost like, I, I know for a fact this movie was like a Hail Mary pass on both Mattel's part for He-Man and Cannon's part to save their business. Right. And it just failed for both. Right, it did not do very well at all when it came out. I mean, I can see why, because um, it's terrible. Yeah. We haven't really talked about how terrible it is. It's terrible. It, well, no, it's awful. It, I mean, if I was to pick out one thing that would be terrible about this film is, like, you watch Masters of the Universe, you see Man at Arms more than you see He-Man. Yeah, that's true. Right. But you you do see him He-Man on, like, a sweet hover disc. <laughs> that's true. Yes! So many points watching this this time, especially where I'm just like, man... This is Flash Gordon's lamer cousin. Yeah. Ouch. <laughs> no, but I love Flash Gordon, though. Flash Gordon has such consistent, like, joy and rampant, like, weird visual aesthetic and way more fun performances that are going on here. Like, everyone's at weird Frank Langella levels of caring about this for some reason in Flash Gordon. Versus here, it's a lot more just, like, so boring we're going throughout like the city suburb streets we don't care and then by the time we go back to Eternia who gives a fuck like Flash Gordon is at least consistently high energy there's no Brian Blessed level awesomeness in this movie yeah I know well yeah dude I mean come on of despite course. Frank Langella trying god help yeah, him yeah but if trying. anybody 
Hawkman. Dive. Dive. Oh my god. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, several times when I was watching this movie, I was like, are they going to bust out into the, the, the Superman song soon? The opening sequence even is a rip-off of the Superman Ooh. title sequence. But I love the fact that they go alphabetically, so Billy Barty is the first credited actor in this movie. <laughs> As he should be, because he's done oh. more than almost any of them. <laughs> really oh, no, I, I agree. Yeah, classic character actor Billy Barty, who's been in, like, so much stuff. And honestly, probably my favorite performance, obviously, being UHF. I was, oh dude, my god! Holy yeah. shit! I don't want to get into it, but I just watched that yesterday. With that in the back pocket, yep. I would love oh, to talk god. about UHF at some point. If they took like a real life approach, He Man probably would have cut all these guys in half down the middle. Right, but they had the classic example of the Mattel was like, "Hey, He Man can't kill things, but mm-hmm. we're doing a big sword and sorcery movie. Make them robots." So it becomes technically right, a sci-fi exactly. fantasy movie, which also, by the way. Um, we, we talked about ripping off Star Wars. Like, this is a sadder version of that. <laughs> oh, yeah, dude, those those guys are just stormtroopers, man. Yep, basically. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, it's a good point. How is He-Man the leader of some crusade? Or he's, like, Skeletor's biggest adversary. He doesn't do dick. Nope. He's constantly getting his ass whipped <laughs> and captured and laser whipped. Like, what is going oh, on? Oh, God, the, we even talk about the laser whip. <laughs> it's so great. <laughs> you mentioned, like, how useless he is as a character, yet they have this big thing after the climactic battle of um, Courtney Cox essentially being Dorothy, which is like, oh, man at arms, oh, Gwildor, but he, man, I'll miss you most of all. Which he didn't he... do dick. I know! <laughs> and Dolph Lundgren has the best, dick. he's the best, like, surfer bro look on his face when he gets cut <laughs> to you after this. It's like, thanks, bra. <laughs> have a great time on Earth. <laughs> He didn't help her at all. Not at all, no. I don't think, like, Lubick should be getting all the fucking awards. The That's what I'm saying. <laughs> I'll miss you most of all, Scarecrow. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> this intergalactic army with all these vehicles and ground troops invades wherever the fuck this movie's supposed to take place. Every town in USA. Earth. Right. Yeah, it's like Ohio. Where the fuck is the rest of the police force and, like, the National Guard and shit like that? A... And the thing is, if a 12-gauge shotgun can take these guys out, True. anybody could have fucking just... There could have been, a, like, just a local militia <laughs> take up arms and, and giving them a fight. Just Skeletor coming and just like, I will take over all the police! Retreat! Oh, wrong 80s cartoon. I'm sorry. Well, let's go ahead and go into our final thoughts, then, on Masters of the Universe. Uh, Dan, go ahead, our guest. Being that I saw it for the first time... I kind of put my mindset into thinking, like, okay, if I was a kid that had the toys and everything, I probably would see right past all the stuff that I see now as just being terrible. However, you'd, you'd be, you would notice certain things, that like, the voices don't match up, his hair don't match, the, some of the things don't look quite right. Who the Why fuck they... is Wildor? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Who are these other characters? Big... So, so you'd be like, okay, so, like, I could 50% see you being a kid and liking it, and 50% being like, what was this crap? And then... To me, I was like, all right, you know, it is what it is. It was entertaining. It went really quick. I wonder what they could have done if they actually got more money and had more time to do it. It is what it is. It was probably used as a marketing tool more than anything, which is how I see it. Adam? The thing is, as a child loving He-Man, watching this movie, clearly there were problems with it, even when I was a kid. There's the health Skeletor look. Wait a second. Where's, where's Battle Cat? You know, shit like that. Uh, yeah, who the f- Fuck it, this Gwildor. <laughs> but the problem with this is, even if they had more time and money, they didn't have a better script. It'd be like making a Batman movie and never showing Bruce Wayne, which might not be a bad thing, but taking him out of Gotham. You mm. can't, there's certain things you can't do. And they just said, fuck it, we're making this movie. And other than Frank Langella, this movie's kind of a mess. I would argue yeah. that Frank Langella's Skeletor is kick-ass. But other than that, it's, it's just a disappointment all the way around. But, I mean, can I even call it a disappointment? No, because you expect it to be bad. It's Masters of the Universe made by canon starring Dolph Lundgren. It's going to be bad. Well, I, I would agree with that roughly. Even as someone, like I said, who was really divorced from He-Man, only knew of it, like I said, from a lot of these stuff that came after the main run of it. I wish this was more entertainingly bad, honestly, because I agree, if it's any of the stuff focused on the villains is either surprisingly good or endearingly over-the-top and cheesy like a Frank Langella as Skeletor, to the point where they have that post credit scene where he's like, I'll be back, and you're almost like, 
I almost want you back, Skeletor, Franklin Jones. Yeah, just to you, though. Just, just to you. <laughs> but, I mean, yeah, overall, um, I, I wish it was more entertainingly bad with some of the stuff, because I would disagree that it went by quick. It feels every sort of minute of its hour 45 minutes, especially when it's on Earth. It's just so much of like, we need to find the key thing. We need to do this. We need to harness the tunes, which, by the way, we didn't talk about how it's musically linked. And that's how you travel through space and time, evidently, is by playing the right note frequency. Okay. Um, I almost wish they kind of did more with that and made it like a Battle of the Bands ending. Because <laughs> he man basically <laughs> has the aesthetic of like an 80s metal band. Which would have made it just awesome if they went full hog with that. That's the thing, it's just if it was more of a tight, weird, sillier movie focused maybe more on some of these villainous characters who are a bit more fun than any of our heroes. I'd probably be more endeared to it. But as it is, it's uh, it's one of the lesser, not as fun canon films. Watch just a super cut of Frank Langella. That's all you really need. Yeah, I agree. Yes. But that and is the end of... Invasion our... USA if you want to see a good canon movie. Oh, there, look, there are so many canon films I would love there to are. cover. So um, let's get into uh, our feedback section where we ask all of you out there about your favorite and least favorite fantasy films. Uh, first off, Rachel Hillis says, uh, favorites include the entire Harry Potter series, Faithfulness to the Books Be Damned, Lord of the Rings, especially Fellowship, and Princess Bride, also Pan's Labyrinth and Shape of Water. Um, I can't disagree with a lot of those. Yeah, I mean, I, I really like, Harry Potter mainly was one that I'm very closely tied to from childhood. We're doing this in honor of Fantastic Beasts and Where to mm. Fuck em, which I have not been as excited about. <laughs> that being a thing. But, I mean, I, I like especially sort of the earlier Harry Potter ones, especially three. Uh, Azkaban. Prisoner of Azkaban is, yeah. yeah that's the best one. That's is definitely the best one. The best one. Um, and Lord of the Rings, I do like that original trilogy. Maybe it's not so much the Hobbit trilogy. Uh, yeah, no, yeah. No, no. To say the least. Um, and uh, Princess Bride's one of my favorite movies. And Pan's Labyrinth, it's not my favorite Del Toro, but it's one of them. No, yeah, I agree. Uh, I, Princess Bride is an all-time classic. Pan's Labyrinth is so fucking good. It's also not my favorite Del Toro, but it's so fucking good. Yeah. And same with The Shape of Water. Not my favorite Del Toro movie, but it's 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 decent. Brian Stitcher of The Horror Returns says, Legend... Hey. Yay! Says, uh, Legend and Beastmaster are two of my favorites. And I will say, I do like Beastmaster. I still remember the whole bit with the cow being impregnated <laughs> thing terrified me as a child. Like, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> That's so weird. Um, but uh, then I will say, I, Legend was the other choice we could have gotten for our good mm -hmm. feature. And I did get a chance to actually watch that for the first time prior to us recording. And man, that's a movie I really want to like more than I do. Yeah, I no, I agree. It, it, it does not hold up because I rewatched it as well. But Tim Curry is still fucking fantastic. Oh, he's it? so good. And also, it's beautifully designed. I love the production oh, design, dude, makeup, fantastic. cinematography. Although, but it's like any... It's my the biggest poster child for me of like Ridley Scott, where I'm so... want to like it more than I do, but it's so mm -hmm. cold and inhuman. Yeah, I, I can agree with that. Brian Kane says, The Berserk film trilogy adaptation is a fine example of dark, violent fantasy. I believe that's an anime thing, from what I've heard. I... I... I have no... Oh! Berserk! Yeah, 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 yeah. With, uh... uh God, Guts, I think, is the lead character. I actually had uh, a Dreamcast game based on him. Mm -hmm. Based on that anime. And it was actually a pretty good anime. I've ne Or, a pretty good game. I've never watched any anime, but, yeah, I do know what he's talking about now that I took a second to think about the feedback. <laughs> um, Nate Thomas says, Kroll is terrible, Conan movies stink, and In the Name of the King is awful. I would argue the first Conan movie is pretty dope. Yeah. I like the first Conan movie for what it is. Is it a good movie? I mean, it's got a lot of flaws, but I like it. The, the rest of them were terrible. No, I mean, yeah. Including the, the, the Jason Momoa remake. Oh, and, God. And The Destroyer is really... Yeah, yeah. it's really bad. Crawl, <laughs> I used to like when I was a kid, but it's it's bad. I, I've never seen Crawl In the Name of the King, mm -hmm. though. It's very accurate. That's... Oh, that's one of the worst. Yeah. It's so bad. And Heather Thomas says favorite fantasy flicks are Labyrinth, Princess Mononoke, and Dragonheart. Least favorite would have to be Neverending Story 2. I have to say, though, some of my favorite So Bad They're Good fantasy films are Troll 2, Fist of the North Star, and Beastmaster. Now, I know it's, she's talking about the live-action Fist of the North Star, okay. starring Gary Daniels and Costas Mandalore. Oh, wow. Um, I'm not aware of this. It's something, dude. <laughs> 
<laughs> Chris Penn is one of the main bad guys in it as well. Mm-hmm. Um, it's something. It is it is terrible, but it's fun. Oh, yeah, Malcolm McDowell's in it, too, for no fucking reason. Of course he is. <laughs> yeah, well, that's Malcolm McDowell. Of um, course he is. I gave her a good call, though, on um, Princess Mononoke. That is a good one. Oh, yeah, I love uh, Miyazaki. That's one of my favorites yeah. of his. Yeah. Pretty much anything he does, I'm into. Of course. Um, we want to thank some people before we leave. We want to thank Chris Oliver for the music used in our show. Listen to more of his music at chrisoliver.bandcamp.com. Though our fantasy music is courtesy of Majestic Hills by artist Kevin McLeod over at Incompotech.com, and it is used under the license under Creative Commons by Attribution 3.0. Also, thanks to Emily Scarda for the art for our show. She accepts commissions at Fiverr with two R's dot com slash E.E. Scarda. And also, of course, thanks to our guest, Dan. Dan, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me on. I had a great time, and I really enjoyed watching willow again and uh you know masters of the universe uh you must have enjoyed watching masters of the universe you watch it fucking twice i had to watch it twice because it's well it's not like when i watch like willow it's like i'm watching something that i kind of finally remember i watched something that i didn't quite understand so i had to kind of watch it again to be like okay yeah to pick up all the nuance yeah I well that's you. true well, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's, it's less of like enjoying more for the sake of an autopsy so you then really like... examine the body <laughs> Anyway, uh, find us on Twitter at DEDBpod. We're also on Facebook. That's our Facebook page uh, link there. We always put up on Mondays the little questionnaire about what's your favorite, least favorite of whatever topic we're doing, so keep an eye out for that. You can also submit feedback to doubleedgedoublebill at gmail.com, all spelled out. I have my own individual Twitter account at NotTheWho'sTommy that you can follow me at on Twitter. I also write reviews at MarianiThomas.wordpress.com. Adam is somewhere off in a fantasy land all his own on the internet. Total Fifty Shades of Grey land. <laughs> well, I'll stay out of that red room for the moment. Yeah, you probably um, should. And uh, also, we want to make sure you all subscribe to us on iTunes, and please rate and review the show to give us more visibility. The more that you rate or review us, the more we rise up in the iTunes ranks, and people are like, hey, I should listen to that double-edged double bill. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's what we're literally that's what intimating. Happens. Yes, but... I mean- take it from a guy that listens to it you should listen to it why don't you write a review that'd be great as a guy who listens to it get on itunes and write a review jesus (laughs) Uh, but on that note gentlemen we have to continue on our quest i was once an adventurer like you till i took an arrow to the knee oh god we're going old memes all right good night everybody (laughs) bye